Hello. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Mustafa Minai, and I'm here to well, be to experience the distinct pleasure and honor of introducing Sir Jibran Nasir. And uh, there are lots of things one can say by way of introducing him. I'll keep it very short. Uh, but let me start by saying that Jibran is risking his life by being here. And he's risking his life by doing what he is doing. He is literally, as we say in Urdu, Jan Hatheli Barakkar Nikal. <clears throat> Just for that, I believe he deserves all our applause. <laughs> most, of you, most of you know this, uh, but for some who may not be familiar, uh, Gibran has actually raised his voice, put his money where his mouth is, turned up out on the street, to lead a movement of Pakistanis and people all over the world, moderate Pakistanis as well, to combat the menace of terrorism, uh, fundamentalism. <clears throat> and uh, he has been um, a, a very successful uh, lawyer. Um, he has uh, been a politician as well. He ran for, uh, the, the, uh, for elections in Karachi as well, very experienced, um, and uh, was literally has become the, the lightning rod for the forces of darkness, as it were, um, is out there, it is, has a large uh, so presence on social media. What I appreciate most about him is that he has a plan. and. Um, he can actually, he explains it very, very well. Um, and we all, uh, he needs our support. Um, even after today, please do uh, keep in touch with him. Uh, do what you can, start where you are, and use what you have. Okay. Uh, and now I'll turn it over to Jibran. Thank you so much for this warm welcome. And uh, Minai Sahib had had the experience of going through the two hours where I just talk and talk and talk and both people yesterday at Princeton. And hence he was able, was able to talk about the plan, but I don't know if I'll be able to live up to that introduction. I don't know how much of a successful lawyer I was. I can't be quite my job as a lawyer. Uh, but yes, I had a promising career. And if this comes down, I'm going to write my Twitter handle on this. And the reason for that is that whatever you critique you have of me, or whatever good things you have to say about me, both things, make it public. Because I don't want to claim that I am the sole representative of Pakistan and I have all the solutions for Pakistan. So if you think I am wrong in my assertions, if you think I am wrong with my solutions, if you think I am wrong with my analysis, make it public and make it known to people back home in Pakistan because I don't want to present them an image which may not be true. So this is my Twitter handle. It's uh, M for Muhammad and then Gibran Nasir. I'm going to quickly walk you through uh, the presentation. It's not going to be that long, and we'll try to keep the session as attractive right after the presentation. But before I begin, uh, I want to ask people here and any three volunteers who could raise their hand and be interactive. Raise your hand, get identified, and whosoever will raise their hand and identify them, just tell me one thing which you think is wrong with Pakistan, that fundamental thing, which is perhaps facilitating or aiding terrorists into doing what they're able to do. If anybody would like to raise their hand. Okay, sir. Start with you. One thing. Intolerance. Intolerance. But is it uh, fine? Tolerance? <coughs> Poverty. You raise your hand, sir, as well? No. Okay, sir. Uh, you're from Pakistan as well? Okay. Lack of education. Lack of education. You know, it's the exact same three responses almost every university I've gone to. And all three of you from Pakistan? Yeah. So at least you're understanding you're going to be right. Yes. Intolerance, poverty, and lack of education. But poverty and lack of education kind of connected because poverty may give rise to lack of education, and lack of education would give rise to intolerance. So they don't they exist in parallel, but they're actually a result of one another. Now, poverty, yes, is one thing, and the reason I wanted to hit on that is 
that when we're going to analyze Pakistan, we cannot compare Pakistan with any European country or any country in North America because you can't compare archaeologists. You're going to take your victim as you find it. And right now in Pakistan, you have one of the lowest rates for literacy in South Asia, which means it's very easy to go and penetrate people's mind because they don't know any of the narratives. If you are in a village where, they has, where they've never seen a teacher, if they've never seen a school, never seen any institution, and you've gone in there and built a school or built a facility or built a mosque or a madrasa, whatever has been your medium to spread your message, and if your audience does not know any of the narrative, then they're going to buy what you have to say to them as gospel truth. And if that truth is that Shias are infidels, kill them, or Ahmadis are infidels and kill them, or anybody of you who's different from you is infidel and is not going to go to heaven, well, that's they, what they know and that's what they're bound to follow because nobody else came in and taught them something else. And of course, in cities and in small towns and villages, people of course have some basic values, but those values come from culture. And Pakistan has always had culture. Even the poorest of people have, have culture, traditions and rituals. That's how they dress, that's what they eat, that's how they do their agriculture and their own trade. Yes, that is there. But when religion comes in, and when religion takes, say, uh, uh, takes its foot on a higher pedestal in culture and slowly starts eradicating your cultural values and is imposed upon you, then that's what you are trying to follow and that's what you are influenced by. Now in Pakistan, as is the case, uh, yes, this is my narrative that we are not a country of Taliban apologists, but does that mean that Pakistan does not have Taliban apologists? That's not true. Pakistan, in fact, right now is going through a surge of growing number of Taliban apologists. Yes, one would say that people have come out and protested against Taliban, like me and many other, and online after Peshawar. But then again, it took us to see 150 bullet-riddled bodies of children before we woke from slumber. And yes, what people don't like in Pakistan right now is the term Taliban, which is a political term. But are people actually against the followings or the methods the Taliban employ? There are many other groups in Pakistan who may not be actually identifying themselves as the Taliban, but they go about doing exactly what the Taliban do. Now with the Taliban, it's easy to identify them because they live in the northern parts of Pakistan in mountainous ranges and that's how from they've been penetrating it. They've also come down to the urban centers. But the Taliban, how you can clearly identify them is that they do not believe in the constitution of the country, they do not believe in the state, the judiciary, the parliament, the executive, they want to overthrow the system and not only impose their own interpretation of Islamic law, but their own system of Islamic governance. So they can be identified as people who are invaders, as expansionists. What is more troubling and what is more dangerous are those militant outfits which do exactly what the Taliban do, which means kill in the name of religion and spread violence in the name of religion, but they embrace your parliament, they embrace your constitution, they embrace your judiciary, and they're working from within. They're infiltrating your urban centers. That's how they're spreading their message. They are right now becoming power brokers of political parties. They are contesting elections and they're spreading a narrative without posing a direct threat or an immediate threat. But slowly and gradually, they are manipulating and perversing and corrupting our mindsets and our ideology. Now, the few things you've learned about Pakistan, or perhaps those who are not from Pakistan, or have read in papers or Western media, or popular media, are perhaps these times. <coughs> it's the only nuclear power in the Muslim world. I'm talking about recently. I'm not in-depth articles about Pakistan, but the most popular news coming out these days. It's a nuclear power. It's one of the seventh largest army in the world. It's a sectarian bit because of the growing Shia Sunni strife. It's called or dubbed as an exporter of terrorism, or a, at least even called the most dangerous country in the world by a few international magazines. And it is also where apparently Saab bin Laden was caught hiding and killed. Now, after reading these facts, if you're not from Pakistan, <laughs> Pakistan is not your destination for spring break. <laughs> you don't want to go there. Even though we have beautiful mountains, beautiful beaches, a lot of culture going on and all that, but no, after noting, reading this, if you don't want to go there, in fact, you want to look at your classmates from Pakistan and say, I feel sorry for you. Is your family safe? Are you sleeping all right? But these are also things about Pakistan. Because when you talk about reclaiming Pakistan, preserving Pakistan, then what is there to save? What is there to salvage? Perhaps these facts. It is the sixth most populated country in the world. It represents almost 4% of the world's population. It is home to over 15 ethnicity and speaks more than 20 languages. You can only imagine, and especially those from India would be able to empathize and identify the diversity, the layers of culture, tradition, rituals, and hospitality, and food, and dance, and whatever comes with the ethnicities and languages and cultures. 
It has a rich sporting tradition. No, we do not only produce militants, we produce stars. <laughs> and sporting stars which have inspired the world. If you go down to West Indies, the J Jamaica and all those islands, and if you ask them, they would be naming you Pakistani fast bowlers from cricket, who they've grown up idolizing in squash and hockey. We've held world championships. And yes, we also are a booming economy. Our population, given our strategic location, we are a corridor to South Asia, Central Asia, and the Middle East. So whether we are bad or good, you cannot ignore us, and the world has to work with us. And more than that, Pakistanis who live with Pakistan have to make it work and have to make it happen. But where have things gone wrong? Is it only a bunch of, you know, a bunch of militants who are picking up arms and killing people? Is that what's wrong with people? Or is it something inherently wrong with the people of Pakistan? Something has changed from within. Something from the north of Pakistan. Which is actually facilitating the narrative of the Taliban. And perhaps that fact is that we have lost around 50,000 civilians, innocent civilians, to terrorism, and almost 5,500 soldiers fighting the war on terror. But what figure is not included in this is 24,000 militants. According to this research, more than 80,000 Pakistanis have perished. And those 24,000 militants matter to me because those are apparently of Pakistan origin. And no one in Pakistan is born a militant. He's turned into one. He's radicalized one. It could be one of you. It could have been me. It's just my share that when I was born into a household where my father was ambitious and he wanted to give me a good education. I could have very well been born in a village in an area where I was perhaps discriminated, discriminated against, where I would have gone or faced poverty, didn't have received any education, could have been corrupted, and I would have been able to become intolerant and then a radical. So these factors could have very well affected me. But because where I'm raised in Pakistan, the family I'm born in, I'm not going to do that. So those 24,000 militants are also a loss of Pakistan because they are my fellow countrymen and we could have saved them by not letting them become militants, by integrating them into a social and political fiber, which the government is failed to do. But because when we say 50,000 civilians have passed away and it does not bother Pakistan as it should, and when I say Pakistan, not just some vocal, secular, progressive groups, but the masses at large, 50,000 is a big figure. We are talking about 18 attacks of the uh, intensity of 9-11 where 3,000 people were killed. 18 such attacks have happened in Pakistan if you want to do and go into maths. Now why have these happened and what this has resulted in is apathy. That people fail to empathize with their own countrymen and when a tragedy happens in Pakistan and a loss happens in Pakistan, we immediately categorize and box that tragedy as a sectarian or an ethnic tragedy and do not observe it as a national tragedy. And what has resulted in is this. And I don't want a Pakistani to react to this. I want non-Pakistanis to answer the question I'm going to ask with this line. Now this is a picture, or two pictures rather, taken in the same city. And as you can see, the man above looks like he's on spring break, but clearly is not. <laughs> the riots are going on burning down housing colonies, and he's pretty happy about it. And so the riots are going on here as well. And this 15-year-old is pretty excited, as if he's in Joyland or Funland or Disneyland. And so is this guy, running around in his early 20s, and the kids seen in the background. Now, who's in, now, people who are not from Pakistan, and I mean not having Pakistani origin. I know there are Americans with Pakistani origin. I know that. But people who have nothing to do with Pakistan in terms of origin or race or ethnicity, can you raise your hand and get identified? All right, so first you. So can you guess and not, don't, don't say that, okay, because I've been putting on a spot and this side has been shown to me and I should sound politically correct and I should not stereotype. But if you are really at Dunkin' Donuts or a place like that and there's a newsstand nearby you and you saw this photo on the cover of Times where the heading <coughs> riots are up in Pakistan and you saw this man, for that two seconds you're going to pass by that newsstand, what religion are you going to identify this man with? Islam. Great, thank you. You, uh, your good name? Priyambada. Priyambada. What about these people here? What religion? Is yes. See, so now you're thinking religion? about it. In two seconds, you're passing the news stand, you say, oh, riots are in Pakistan, Bangladesh, these people. What religion? Islam. So the notion is in Pakistan, Muslims are becoming extremists and intolerant. <coughs> but what is actually happening here is not, that is not a complete reality. These are the facts. In the picture above, Muslims were writing in burning down Christian colony in Lahore. In the picture below, 
Christians were writing, and what they are dragging right here is a body of a Muslim man who was burnt alive a few minutes ago before it was being dragged. And another body was dragged along with it. Does it mean that Christians in Pakistan are extremists? No. Does it mean that they are terrorists? No. Does it mean that Christians in Pakistan are violent? No. In fact, we cannot even compare the violence or the persecution which minorities have faced with what perhaps this man faced that day, this un unfortunate man faced that day. But what has happened here? And the picture above the man and the mob with him went into Joseph Colony and they burnt down a house because the man was alleged of blasphemy. So they came in and they went in to save and guard the honor of the Prophet and in trying to burn his house down, they ended up wiping a big part of the colony, burning around 200 houses. But when this man is doing that act, he is saying that I am doing this to guard the honor of the Prophet in the Islamic Republic where Allah's law is implied and imposed and if I am doing something, nobody is going to ask me a question because this is the right thing to do and the state can't even dare arrest me for this because this is Prophet's honor we are talking about. So the man above has no fear of the state. But what's happening below is that two churches were attacked in Lahore in a series of attacks which have targeted religious sites. And not the first time churches have been attacked in Pakistan. So two churches were attacked during Sunday Mass and these protesters came out and one of the miscreants of the mob identified a conservative looking Muslim man as one of the suspects. And the people reacted, beat him down and they burned him alive. And there's a video on Facebook which is often taken down but appeared again by some people who want people to see graphic stuff and that video is when these two men are being burned alive. And the mob is around 100-200 people surrounding these two men and all 100 of those or 200 of people of those are holding smartphones in their hand and filming it. The sight, the smell is not bothering them. They are not traumatized. This kid does not look traumatized because but then again he is. Traumatized does not mean that you are shivering and you are not able to control yourself. It also means that you have gone numb. And the reason these people were taking law in their own hand because they have time and again experience that when someone accuses them of blasphemy, like it happened above and burns down their houses, the state does not do anything. And when someone attacks churches or threatens churches, the state does not do anything. And if we identify someone as a suspect and report them to the authorities, the state would not do anything and would let the man go. So it's better to be the judge, jury and executioner right there and then. So the man above has no fear of the state and the people below have no faith in the state. And in both instances, the state has faith. In both instances, the state is incompetent and is inefficient and not being able to do its job right. But then, and when we say the military, the state is the military and the military establishment. But as you may see it, for the past eight years, Pakistan is having democracy. And right now, under democracy, this man represents the state. <laughs> they laughed again. You know why it's the joke? <laughs> Brown, Mount Holyoke, Harvard, Yale, MIT, Princeton, they all laughed when they see his face. <laughs> <laughs> they all laughed. It's on video. I show the slide and he's not Prime Minister guy, he shows some respect. <laughs> I'm wearing the Pakistani flag here. He's a Prime Minister, he represents the state. Yes, he looks docile and naive and confused and does not know what he's doing. <laughs> but he is the Prime Minister and he represents the state. Now, one would say that what's going wrong in Pakistan right now has to do with him because he is the head of the country. Nawaz Sharif is his name. Can anybody tell me who this man is? And who is Udhyanvi? He is the founder of Lakshari Sangmi. No, 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 no. He's not the founder of Lakshari Sangmi. He is now the president. Has nothing to do with the apparently. Some. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Lashkar Jangvi is a splinter group. A splinter group which was founded by Malik Hisab Jangvi, which Lughanvi has tried to bring back <coughs> again and again into Elisun al Jamaat. And what was Elisun al Jamaat known as before? JIT? No, no, Jamaat Islami, for God's sake. It's one of the biggest parties today in the parliament. I don't think they're not that bad. Sipai Sahaba. Now, the reason I use Sipai Sahaba because Ahle Sunnat Wal Jamaat is a bit of a tongue twister <laughs> and also a misnomer because it is the proper full name for all the Sunnis in the world. So, technically, I am Ahle Sunnat Wal Jamaat if I am supposed to identify myself as a Sunni or any Sunni Muslim here would be Ahle Sunnat Wal Jamaat. So, it's a misnomer as they use it for their purpose because the, the proper name for them is that Shia are known as Ahle Tashi and Sunnis are known as Ahle Sunnat Wal Jamaat. So, Sipai Sahaba, that's what he had. Now, what is Sipa Sahaba? Can you tell me? It's a terrorist group that targeted Shias. 
terrorist group targets. It, it, it is the biggest Sunni militant terrorist organization in Pakistan. And the reason he said terrorist and I say militant and I do not say he's wrong is because it's not his assumption that they are terrorists. And it's not my assumption that they are militant. The state has told us that. The state banned them in 2002 and said that you are a banned militant group. And they resurfaced as Millet Islami and they were banned again by the state. And now they recently resurfaced as Ali Sunnah Wal Jamaat and they were banned again in 2012. For the past 13 years, the state has been banning them time and again and declaring them as a banned militant outfit. And not just Pakistan, in countries abroad. I mean, in UK, if you go into their home, um, home office website, it's one of the proscribed organizations because Elias and the Jamal Sipha Sahaba tried to open international chapters as well. So it is known as a banned outfit. So what this man, the state, has done right is ban this man. But then what is this? The state and the banned militant. And they're clearly not praying for Shias to be safe in Pakistan. <laughs> now, the ideological or the political manifesto of Sipah Sahaba has always been to declare Shias, which is around representing 25% of the Muslim population in Pakistan, as infidels under the constitution. And being declared infidel under the constitution of Pakistan has ramifications for the rights to exercise or the rights you have as a Pakistani. Because, for example, if you're not a Muslim in Pakistan, you could never ever be able to compete for the office of the Prime Minister or the President. It does not matter, you could be the biggest philanthropist, the biggest entrepreneur, the biggest employment provider, the biggest taxpayer, the biggest public servant, but Asif Ali Zardari would fare better than you because he's a Muslim and you are not. So that's how perverse the law is. And Pakistanis would know why I give Zardari's example because he's considered not to be the best examples to give. That's why he's leading a country's concern. Now, okay, this is the state and this is Ahmed Gandhi. Does anybody know which is the opposition party in Pakistan in the parliament right now, the big one? Aksan Youth Party and who is the leader of opposition? Can you recognize Oshisha if you see him? Yeah. Can you recognize him here? Yeah, he's sitting with very casually you're making that comment as if you're not surprised. <laughs> See, a lot of people don't get surprised seeing Nawaz Sharif being a right of center party, being a conservative party, being a party founded under the era of Zaul Haq, under the same era when Sipa Sahaba was formed. But people should get surprised because People's Party is supposed to be a center of left party, a progressive party, a liberal party. And even them, they are getting, well, he seems uncomfortable, but he's like, okay. <laughs> uh, he's like, what did I just get myself into? Right? Uh, but this is the opposition. Now, the head, now, if this is the parliament, and this is the treasury benches, the one who rules, and this is the opposition benches, well, both of them are dining and whining. Now, can anybody tell what Karachi is, for those who don't know what Karachi is? <laughs> oh wow. No, I'm not looking for to brand Karachi. I'm not like asking for that's good. Karachi is magic, good tourism. Nice. But uh, otherwise, what Karachi actually is, besides magic? It's a melting pot of cultures and ethnicities and people that are migrants and refugees and people who've already been there. I was just looking for the biggest city in Pakistan. <laughs> but, uh, but it is a melting pot. Yeah, but yes, but it is the biggest city in Pakistan. And the reason Karachi is important because it's economic social hub to what we are ending at. And the way she said that home to migrants and many ethnicities and communities is true completely because if you experience Pakistan, if you've experienced Karachi, you can't experience Pakistan. Because every single ethnicity, race, language, culture is present, except for the mountains, the beautiful mountains up north, everything else is in Karachi. Who owns or runs Karachi? Yeah. Very comfortably. By the way, the polls today again reaffirmed that that they have a stronghold in Karachi. But okay, MQM is the leading party in Karachi. Now, MKM is also known as, I often said it to be a fascist party. And a lot of extortion cases and target killing cases are often associated with them. They've also faced a lot of operations. And MKM may deny these allegations, but these allegations exist. But regardless of these allegations, the liberals and the progressives in Pakistan have time and again found it amongst themselves to actually defend MKM and its existence. And the reason perhaps for that could be that MKM says it is a secular party. The MKM perhaps is the only party who has the audacity to stand up and speak up for the most persecuted community in Pakistan being the Ahmadi community. And for that, they are loved and adored by the liberals, at least somebody is saying the right things. And yes, they may be a fascist party and they may have resorted to violence, but at least they don't do it in the name of religion and they don't have ties with militants. 
Can anybody tell me who Aurangzeb Faruqi is? Same man, he's an expert in Pakistan city in Bangladesh. He is currently the president of Sipai Sahaba. Rajani is the head. Aurangzeb Faruqi is the president of Sipai Sahaba. Can you identify Aurangzeb Faruqi in this picture? Yeah, he's standing on the right. <laughs> <laughs> this picture is from 2013. The man next to him is the then Rafta committee member of MKM. By the way, this is the executive committee of MKM visiting Sipa Sahaba in their office in Karachi. And I was on television those days doing a current affairs show, actually the year after, and I showed this picture to a member of MQM, a minister of MKM, and I asked them, what were you doing here? And they said, oh, we were there to talk about peace. Well, apparently those who claim to own Karachi, need to go to militants to talk about peace and make them stakeholders and power brokers for them to actually talk about peace. But America has, a, has the, the statement that we don't negotiate with the terrorists, we actually sit with them and have a try perhaps. Uh, we'll try on that note. Uh, now, which is the only party which I have not talked about? The main big party, which comes to your mind. How many PTI supporters are sitting here? Raise your hand. Don't be afraid, you're afraid because you know I'm going to challenge you right now, I'll put you on the spot. <coughs> Look, before this, before me coming here, before this, before me coming here and showing this presentation, I've been asking that question. If you supported PTI and it's right to have political opinion, it's better than having no opinion. At least you're involved in the process. Did you support PTI? Raise your hand. I supported. Supported PTI. Okay, fine. Now, PTI is a party which has time and again set, it raised a slogan, Nea Pakistan which means new Pakistan, which means we are going to do things the new way. Not this way, but the new way. We're going to bring about a revolution and one good thing, one really big good thing PTI has done, and I cannot take away the credit from for whatever I may disagree with them, is that they have made the electorate aware that they should come out and vote and have the value of that vote. And we should give credit whenever someone does a good thing because that is the only way you can claim to be neutral. You may not agree with them completely, but whatever good someone does, for example, and saying it's a secular party and talking about MEDs, the good thing they do. But this, I don't agree with. So PTI has said that, you know, you should come out and vote and be part of democracy. Good stuff. Well, mostly and they say, in NA215 in Karachi. Pardon? Mostly in NA215 in Karachi, PTI has said come out and vote. Other than KPK and other areas. No, actually you... everywhere. But can I complete the presentation and then I'm going to take the Q&A. Because as far as I, because I contested elections, so I very well know that they have been very vocal about coming out and voting all over Pakistan and not just any 250. Even though they were my competitors, but I'll give them that much. Now, when they say new Pakistan or near Pakistan and revolution and change, they also say that we are not a secular party. They say we are right of center and they say that we want to make an Islamic welfare state. But just because someone is right of center and just because someone says that we should negotiate with the Taliban and find a peaceful solution, I cannot persecute them for that. Because Taliban again are an invasive force and they were saying that perhaps Taliban are people who face collateral damage because of drones and have been disenfranchised. Unlike Sipa Sahaba, Sipa Sahaba, by the way, these people never had any drones attacking them. They have never had any military operation against them. They have no reason to be violent but because they just want to turn off the system. But Taliban, Imran Khan has always said, let's talk to them, let's get them on the table. Now that have been in change after Peshawar, but again, just because you want to talk to the Taliban or the terrorists to find a peaceful solution, and those terrorists who you believe have been disenfranchised and otherwise had no problem with Pakistan. I cannot persecute you or hold you responsible for that. But what I'm up against is this one thing to talk to the terrorists and those who have been disenfranchised to say that, you know what, if we provide the facilities, are you willing to let go of agenda? And it's quite another to take this support, active support, to contest elections. And this is Kashmir this month. Azad Kashmir Indians don't get. Yeah, right up. Uh, Azad Kashmir, the one we have. Uh, uh, this man here, Sultan Mahmood, is a former Prime Minister of our Kashmir and he contested elections only this month and uh, this people all around him and that flag is Sipa Sahaba Azad Kashmir. And that in the corner, if you can see, is Imran Khan. And he is a PTI candidate and this picture, and it's a public by the way, you can find it online everywhere. You can even see if those of Pakistan, ARY and Sama and everybody covering this, the mics here. And this uh, gathering took place where Sipa Sahaba announced this support for PTI in the upcoming elections. Only this month, two days later, they won the elections, PTI, and the whole Sipa Sahaba Twitter feed went viral and crazy thanking people who have come out and voted.
and said that the person we nominated and loved uh, has won and he was thanking them as well for their support. Now, the problem with this is that I've shown you the four main big parties in Pakistan and all sitting on the table with terrorists. But does that mean that we need to shut down all these political parties? Does that mean that we need to completely wipe them out and wait for a fifth party? Does that mean that I'm going to stand here and say, oh, you know what, I am the option, vote for me? No, it does not mean that. Because what People's Party and PMLN and MTM and PDI has is infrastructure, is outreach, is members, is an institution. And when institutions go wrong, you don't destroy them, you reform them. So if today you believe that you align yourself with any party, then don't get disillusioned by seeing these pictures. Get real after seeing these pictures and realize how much you need to work within these parties to reform them, to save them, to bring them on the right track. They cannot be duplicating our efforts and reinventing the wheel again and again in Pakistan. All these parties right now are forced to sit with militants because militants have become a reality in Pakistan. Because all these militants are allowed to grow for the purpose of the Afghan Jihad in which the military threw up. And the big reason why these terrorist outfits and militants actually exist in Pakistan is because of the Pakistan military and them turning a blind eye. And when militancy rose up, sectarian militancy, it was not just Sunni militancy. Shia militants like Sippah Muhammadi also came to prominence. But when the military struck back, Sippah Muhammadi was made defunct. But Sippah Sahaba was not made defunct because Sippah Sahaba did something which Sippah Muhammad could not do. And that was providing fighters and their ideological firepower for Mujahideen in Afghanistan, for providing support to Mullah Omar, belonging to the Deobandi school of thought. And that does not mean that every Deobandi is a terrorist. Just like if Al-Qaeda identifies themselves as Muslim, does not mean that every Muslim belongs to Al-Qaeda. What they follow is a perverse interpretation of the Deobandi school of thought. What Al-Qaeda follows is perhaps a perverse interpretation of Islam. So because these have become a reality, they need to sit with them across the table. And when they are seeking support from them, as all of those parties were, <coughs> because all of those parties, by the way, do not meet and give them for peaceful resolutions, uh, in 2013 on summer television, the general secretary of Sipai Sahaba, right in the run up to the elections, came out and said on live television and took names, specific names, of members of all parties and said that they all come to our houses and beg us for votes and for support. <coughs> all of them take support because Sipai Sahaba has infiltrated Pakistan in various areas and we think perhaps that only a handful of militants have done so we can take them out? No. They are a growing number. They are a growing massive number. And this is only the tip of the iceberg that in 2013, 55 charged terrorists, not alleged, charged terrorists were identified in the Anti-Terrorism Act of Pakistan were allowed to contest polls. If all of the 55 were contesting only for the National Assembly, well, 55 seats means around one-seventh of Pakistan's parliament. And 40 of these were from Sipai Sahaba. And now, because Sipai Sahaba has been banned, they were contesting elections under a vehicle, Muttehada Dini Mahas, which was created by this man here, who was sitting comfortably between the Prime Minister and Rajanvi, Samuel Ha, who provides his party the facility to come out and contest elections. And 55 of them contested elections, and 40 of them were from Sipai Sahaba. And another example, or because I mentioned Karachi, and Karachi being the melting pot, and Karachi being the small little mini Pakistan. Orange Farooqi, the president of Sipai Sahaba, when he contested elections in 2013, the May ones, I'm not going to talk about those figures, because everybody said those were rigged. So we're not going to believe in those. Well, then forget the May elections. After the May elections, after the election commission said that these elections in this constituency were rigged, where Aurangzeb Faruqi was contesting from, which was Kaidabad, by-elections were announced. And the by-elections, again, MQM and Aurangzeb Faruqi contested against each other for that particular seat. And Aurangzeb Faruqi only lost from two to 300 votes. But do you know how many votes he got in Karachi, in our cultural, social and economic hub? And these figures are public record on the ECP website. More than 23,000. So 23,000 unarmed civilians in Pakistan, Karachi, believe that Aurangzeb Faruqi, who says that Shia should be declared infidels under the constitution, are right. And that is the growing narrative they are hammering into us. Because there is no counter-narrative in Pakistan. It's one thing to say that Lujhanvi is bad. But it's quite another to identify someone else as an alternate. 
It's one thing to say that this interpretation of Islam is perverse, but it's quite another to identify what is the right interpretation of Islam. The progressive forces, the liberal forces, and the government you can't expect much from them right now have done nothing to create awareness around that. And perhaps part of the problem has also been that why do we even get into the interpretation of Islam? Why was Islam even allowed to be part of our history and of our curriculum and of our constitution so heavily and so deeply that everything we do in Pakistan is judged not just socially, not just economically and politically, but legally as well. That you cannot be the prime minister if you are not a Muslim. That Pakistan has become so perverse that when MDs are persecuted, not were they only declared infidels, but 10 years later in 1984, through an ordinance which was passed by Zawal Haq, and which ordinance has been maintained and intact, and actually reformed the penal code, and has been maintained by all the political parties, that ordinance actually makes it a crime for any Ahmadi to pose as a Muslim. What do you mean by pose as a Muslim? In Pakistan, when I say, Assalamu Alaikum, what would be the response? Wa if an Ahmadi responds to me like that, three years of imprisonment. Because he just posed as a Muslim. And that's true. That's true. Court convictions, precedent available on record and Ahmadis in prison are proof of that. Usually we must have seen wedding cards in Pakistan, people writing Bismillah, Rahman and Rahim on top of it. A couple was convicted for three years because they wrote Bismillah, Rahman and Rahim and they were Ahmadi. If you are seen offering prayers on a floor mat, you're posing as a Muslim three years. If you're fasting in Ramadan, posing as a Muslim three years. If you're offering sacrifice in Rabba last year alone, MDs were not allowed to, by authorities, sacrifice any animal on Eid because on those three days, only Muslims can do so. And you cannot pose as a Muslim. Now, these are things perhaps we don't even know about. If you don't even know about things, where the empathy would come? We are living in not even at the state of ignorance right now. And because this is becoming the reality of Pakistan, and this is what we want to change. Now, because I'm kind of in a bit of a flow, and you guys seem really zoned into it, I'm going to quickly come to the solution as well. So when I take questions at the very end from all of you, we can involve and you can actually, and when I say my solution, my solution is not word of God or gospel truth or the last thing to do. My solution, the reason I'm coming to universities and I'm coming to UPenn and gone to other universities, and I'm not meeting the US government and senators and congressmen because they can't solve or help my country. <clears throat> young minds, young Pakistani minds, be it those who are going to run to Pakistan or be it those who are going to live here, the diaspora can help Pakistan. Because you guys have vested interest. Regardless whether you're Pakistani, you're going to go back, or you're Pakistani American or American of Pakistani origin, you would be profiled passing through airports. That's the baggage you carry. So if you are vested in Pakistan and have something to do with Pakistan, this is the solution I'm going to give, and the reason my Twitter handle is there, and the reason my contact information is going to be there, that I want your feedback on how to make the solution much more better. Because what in school, guys? I've got C's and D's in my levels. I could never attend UPenn or any of the universities I've spoken at. You guys are much more smarter and much more brilliant than I am. That's the assumption, and hence I'm here to learn from you and take your feedback. So my solution to the problem right now is an online forum. An online platform. And the reason an online platform and not mainstream media, not print media, because those are heavily regulated and heavily censored. When I was on media on Dawn News, I remember, and I was reporting on the death of Dr. Mehdi Ali, uh, one of the doctors who actually lived in America, was an Ahmadi and had come down for sabbatical to serve in Pakistan to actually provide heart and cardiological treatment to the poor. He was killed in Rabwa in his city for being an Ahmadi. So it was a story of an Ahmadi doctor coming back to Pakistan and being killed for being an Ahmadi. And when I was deciding to report that news, Dawn News said, you can so do so, but the one word you will not use on air while reporting this incident is Ahmadi. And, I, and how I went about it is that some parliamentarians in Pakistan have tweeted about it. The Dr. Mehdi Ali was killed for being an Ahmadi, so I quote, quoted those tweets. But I was still censored and that six minute commentary on his death was reduced to 40 seconds and the news was a doctor comes back to Pakistan and gets killed and his family wants justice. So how are people going to know anything? And by online media, because online media is ever expanding in Pakistan, 35 million internet users, 15 million Facebook users and 10 million Twitter users. But when we're going to say, well, online means rural areas primarily, sorry, urban areas primarily and not so much rural areas, what you're going to do about rural areas? But the point is, Terrorism and hate speech did not spread from rural areas. It spread from urban centers. And it's very simple common sense. To spread hate literature, you need a literate audience. 
and that treated audience is in urban centers. So you're going to talk about de-radicalizing things and providing a counter narrative. You need that treated audience and you need to de-radicalize your urban centers before you go towards rural centers. And far as rural centers are concerned, in third, if you go with just fluoride contaminated water and not clean drinking water, you'll find big billboards of Kelly on talk shop. So there are smartphones and 3G in third, but there's no drinking water. It's ever expanding. And because media and online media not being regulated allows you that access. And another thing, since I have mentioned third here, Right now, does anybody from India know who Hafiz Saeed is? Of course you know. What is his biggest crime which India thinks he has done? More than that, something more recent. Mumbai attack. Mumbai attack. And what is the organization which he runs in Pakistan? Jamaat <laughs> Dawa. Lashkar Tayyiba. Is not actively run by him, he's not the face of it, he's not seeing the face of it. He runs the soft face of Rashkari Taiba, Jamatu Dawa, which is a charity organization, not an organization of militants. You go into Jamatu Dawa, you would find relief workers and ambulances and medical aid camps and stuff like that, and doctors. You won't find militants and armed guards. And if you go to Jamatu Dawa's <coughs> website right now, what would you find on Jamatu Dawa's website? As I was talking about third, it says on the website right now, if you go onto it right now or after the talk, that they have just commenced the second, not the first, the second round of relief operations in Thar. And that is what Jamaat Dawa does. That is what terrorist organizations do. They have a soft charity organization set up, which goes into a place, sees the people who don't have basic amenities, provide them those facilities, builds their trust, and after that trust has built, and Hafiz Saeed is made to look Santa Claus with people of Thar, then they introduce their literature, their sermons, and they radicalize people. So if Hafiz Saeed is today arrested because of international pressure and handed to India, Sipa Sahaba won't be protesting. Before that, Thar, and Thar being one of the most secular parts of Pakistan, will be protesting. Because the guy who was giving them safe drinking water is not there anymore. And Sipa Sahaba was formed by a man called Lashkar by Haknawaz Jhangvi. And Haknawaz Jhangvi, if you read his biography, the reason he got to be so liked by the people of Pakistan of Jhang was because he used to provide free legal aid to poor litigants in Jhang. And that's how he gained their trust, always having that soft image and soft face. Now, coming back to what I was talking about, the online forum. It's called Never Forget Pakistan. And I'm also quickly going to write the website. It stays with you in your hair. And when you're going to go on that website, you're going to find a form, a simple form, which you can sign into your Facebook or your Twitter. And much after I've left the campus, you guys are still in touch with me. And as I curate the project, you guys stay in touch with me. And you can contribute to it. You can give your feedback. You can form part of the team. And now what the project is, I'm going to quickly come to that. It's an online news disseminating website which is supposed to, to run into or turn into an online radio and an online web television. Something you can like say, imagine NPR providing a secular progressive view as it does in America. And this is supposed to do is not only produce content in terms of documentaries and research reports, but also animated series and comic books and cartoons. So that your audience which you're trying to de that you're trying to influence is as young as three years old. You're not only going to turn around the adults, but you're going to work around nurturing the minds, the young minds, and bringing that up from the very beginning, providing them secular, progressive, liberal values in Pakistan. As much as you could do, and try to create that awareness. One of the campaigns you're running in this one is called Aaj Ke Din on this day, which is supposed to be a chronological calendar of every single terror attack in Pakistan, every single act of sectarian violence, every single attack of target killing, so that you know that during which era and under whose government Pakistan was most vulnerable to terror attacks and what the pattern was. And this is linked with the campaign called Hamari Zameen, our land, a geographical database of all these terror attacks. So that you know that which part and portion of Pakistan is most affected by terrorism and which is the area that requires the most attention. But when you're going to be archiving terror attacks, but terror attacks produce two kinds of things, the attacker and the victim. And the victim for me, regardless of his faith or race or ethnicity, is a hero. Hamari hero, our hero. At Tazar Sassam, a boy in Hamdu gave his life fighting single-handedly a suicide bomber and in doing so gave up his own life but saved 900 kids who were in the assembly at that time. And Pakistan did not wake up at that time. Pakistan did not realize that schools are on the hit list. We again had to see 150 bodies in Peshawar to realize that. At Tazar had already told so. When he defended his school in Hangu, he had told you that Taliban are going to come for school and children. And I have done this to save you from that horror. But we, of course, did not wake up. 
And it was our elder brother, Mushtaba is a friend of mine, and I discussed with him um, the idea that what if there was a comic book character based on Atazaz's life, which could, kids could grow up being inspired by. And we don't have to read Spider-Man and Batman to do character building. We could do our own comic book heroes, our own heroes for little kids. And he said that nothing better <coughs> would serve my brother's legacy if he could inspire those people much after he is gone. And this is one idea. The idea is also actually to humanize people, to sensitize people, to give the figure of 50,000 civilians a face, a life story, a biography, an insight into what is left of the families, and those who actually survived terror attack but lost a limb, how their lives have been affected, and to empathize with them, and what does it mean for them to be Pakistani? What do, what do they want from other Pakistanis as far as terrorism is concerned? But when you're going to identify your heroes, you also need to identify your enemies, Hamara Dushman. Every single band outfit in Pakistan working in the name of religion or sectarian uh, sects and spreading violence, where do they exist, where the head offices are, what their flags look like, what their members look like, what is their nexus of political parties, when did they contest elections, with whose support and whose support did they withdraw, and who gave them an election ticket, how many legal cases have been filed against them, how many are dormant, how many are active, what is the government doing about it? Knowing each and everything, and also, once you go on a chronologically, get the data and geographically get the data of terror attacks and you're going to link it with them, you're going to give each band militant outfit its own body count. That which terrorist organization has killed how many people in Pakistan. So you get to know in real who is public enemy number one. And you further cannot just tell people that this is the bad guy and this is the good guy when they want to come around and say, but Pakistan was made in the name of religion. Pakistan was made in the name of Islam. We are an Islamic Republic. If somebody is saying that, yes, in the name of Islam is allowed to kill, but we are made in the name of Islam, they're going to justify that, they're going to buy that. But then again, that's what went wrong with Pakistan. Even the course books you guys have grown up reading and have gotten admissions on the basis of that in Wharton were perverse books and made perverse by Zawul Huck in 1979 with his education policy, where all our heroes belong to minorities were taken out systematically, and all those people who had nothing to do with Pakistan education, like Mahmoud Ghaznavi whose biggest achievement is coming down and invading India and breaking a Hindu temple. So if your hero in your history book is the guy who broke Hindu temple, then why would you feel bad if somebody attacked a church or, or broke down a temple? Because that's what heroes are supposed to do. Now you guys, because of your own exposure and insight, may find the acts of breaking down a church abhorrent, but not the majority of Pakistan is enjoying the exposure you guys have had. And they may only be buying as gospel truth what they read in their history books, like Muhammad and Qasim. His biggest achievement to come and kill a Hindu Raja Dahir in India came. But again, you don't even know if that's through history or not. But what about those people who played an active part in the creation of Pakistan, our founding fathers, our sporting stars, our cultural stars, who celebrated Pakistan, projected us, and they could have belonged to a non-Muslim background. What about them? What about our history? Hamari Tariq. What is the history which we are not being taught in our own courses? For example, if one would say that Pakistan is an Islamic Republic made in the name of Islam, and supposed to have Islamic laws, then the idea would be that to make an Islamic constitution or Islamic law, you would need an Islamic jurist. You would need an Islamic scholar who perhaps could be a Muslim or non-Muslim, but has to be an Islamic jurist. But does anybody know here who the first law minister of Pakistan was and who was also served as the head of the constitutional committee who Jinnah appointed? Mandal. Jaginder Nath Mandal, a Hindu. So clearly Jinnah was not looking for an Islamic constitution being drafted by a Hindu. And again, the first foreign minister, very important because when you're freshly carved out, out of nowhere, and you have no history of your own, you have culture, yes. But the world does not know which way you're going to, your economics or your politics is going to swing. You do not know that. Then you need a face to show to the world. And that face, our first foreign minister, was an Ahmadi, the Fullah Khan. And much, for example, do we even know the man called R.P. Singha? whose vote actually got us a side of and parts Punjab actually got, but just because he belonged to a minority, his participation and his uh, contribution to our freedom struggle is not mentioned anywhere. All those people from minorities who served in our armed forces. Does anybody know that Pakistan at one time actually had a na national basketball team, which actually participated in international competitions? And all five of those boys were Christians. But we don't want that. We don't want cultural heroes coming out who could be a Christian or who could be a Hindu. We don't want that. We don't want them becoming mainstream. But when we think of Pakistan, we think of Muslim and Muslim head of states because a Hindu or a Christian cannot just be good enough. 
But we need to change that to tell people our history that don't get judged by your religion, get judged by your deeds and by your acts as people. And further, when you move on, when you talk about Islam, because some people are so radicalized that they're not willing to even listen to your progressive and secular thought. And you cannot just engage people the way you want to. You have to engage with it as you find your victim. You need to work towards them, not to drag them towards you. And that's how you make a conversation and a dialogue happen. Back in Pakistan, people have time and again tried to do things the, the other way, and that is us liberals here and you right wings there. But I don't get it. Just because someone has a beard and someone wears his shalwar above his ankles does not make him an extremist. And just because somebody wears a suit or wears his jeans below his waist does not make him a liberal. You become an extremist or liberal from here. If you can tolerate people and their views, you're a liberal. And if you can't, then it does not matter if you drink alcohol or if you party out or if you eat pork. And I'm only giving those examples because in Pakistan, these are considered crimes and are associated with godless secular people. But that's the thing. You become it, you become here. And because you need to engage these people and bring them on the board, and you need to set the, even the Islamic narrative sites, you've got an in-house Islamic research center which is going to produce content and it's called Reclaim Your Mosque. And the reason this is important is because it's one thing to rule in the name of Islam, it's quite another to rule in the name of perverse interpretation of Islam, and a very third thing to rule in misinformed notion of Islam. I'll give you an example. How many of you have heard of the word or the phrase blasphemy law? All of you. What's the punishment for blasphemy law in Pakistan? Only one knows that. If you have, say, insulted the Prophet, it's a uh, life imprisonment. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> You're not studying law here. <laughs> <coughs> Death. But it's quite another thing that, you know, people actually going to court and filing the complaint. If you hear someone has done blasphemy, like I showed the man above, you just go down, burn down their house, and you burn them alive. Like Shama Shada, the young couple in Lahore, as you did with them. That's all you do. And people do that because they believe that is the right thing to do. That is what God commanded us to do. That is what the prophets commanded us to do. That is what the Imams have commanded us to do. But if I just quote to the example of blasphemy, which makes news from Pakistan time and again, there is no punishment for blasphemy in Islam, or at least death, as far as it's concerned. And it's not just my interpretation, by the way, of Quran or a Hadith, because I'm not a religious scholar, but I can read the teaching of the scholar. In Pakistan, 80% of Muslims are Sunnis, and out of 80% of the Sunnis are Hanfis, which follow the Hanfi school of thought made by Imam Abu Hanifa. And Imam Abu Hanifa's teachings are copied by two individuals, Imam Yusuf and Imam Muhammad. And Imam Yusuf is the only one who copied his, his, his teachings regarding blasphemy law. And since Imam Abu Hanifa, does anybody know who Abul Allah Mahdi is? The man who formed Jamaat Islami, J.I. From Hanifa, and you may actually like Mahdi for this one. From Hanifa to Maududi, sermon after sermon, fatwa after fatwa, decree after decree, blasphemy is not punishable by death. Then how did it make it into a law? How did it make it into a content? How did it become the political context that it is? Because of one man, one imam, one dissenter called Imam Tehmiya, whose book was made mainstream by the radicals, was popularized by the radicals. So if you go to Madrasa, and you get teaching, and you want to know anything about marriage or divorce or state or politics, they teach you Imam Humble, Imam Shafi, Imam Hanifa. But when you want to know about blasphemy, Imam Tamiya. Why? Because it serves their purpose. But forget even that. Pakistani law for blaspheming the Prophet or insulting the Prophet was drafted by a man called Ismail Qureshi for Zawad, an advocate, who actually quoted Fatwa Shami as the fatwa in which he said that blasphemy is punishable by death. And he quoted that and he made the law. But when a friend of mine very recently, his name is Arafat Mazar, who is doing amazing work regarding blasphemy law in Pakistan, he confronted Ismail Qureshi only last year and said that, sir, you quoted Fatwa Shami for this. And he said, yes. Have you read the Fatwa? And he said, I didn't. Then I heard about it. Well, sir, this is the Fatwa. Stop being lazy. If you could just read this highlighted part. Blasphemy is not punishable by death as per Fatwa Shami. And that man drafted the law, that man made the law, and in the name of that law, countless people are persecuted and countless continue to live in fear. Because we do not know anyone to set the narrative right. 
as does this blasphemy law. This think tank is supposed to work on takfirism, on jihad, on minority rights, on blasphemy law, on hadood ordinance. Because in Pakistan, as the ground reality are, and you can accept it, you cannot change or challenge a law on secular values, but you can challenge a law if under the constitution you can prove it to be repugnant to Quran and Sunnah. And blasphemy is an example of that kind of thing. And you move forward to something we call Hamari Siyasa, our politics. The amusing individuals I showed you before. And why this is important? Because you cannot have a functioning democracy if you don't have a functioning parliament. People don't even know if the MNA and the MPA they voted for even bothered showing up in parliament. You don't even know if they're attending their office properly. Right now, who, so ha who has heard or must have seen on Facebook the controversy regarding the cybercrime bill? And what is that bill doing right now? Is it passed by the committee in parliament? But what is the bill going to do if it's passed with parliament? If you any form of political speech will be immediate. Any form of political dissent on social media would become a law. So if I tweet right now that I don't agree with the decision of Nawaz Sharif for anything, it's a crime. If I make a meme on it on Facebook, it's a crime. Talk about cutting down a freedom of speech. But like I said, it's been passed by the Parliamentary Committee and now it's front of the Parliament to be pulled upon. And the reason the Parliament Committee was able to pass it is because the opposition party members didn't bother showing up. Because they were lazy. And now they're creating a huge ruckus. Oh, look at the national government taking away our freedom. Well, what way were you when the thing was being discussed? Only one man from MQM Ali Abdi showed up and bothered showing up. And he was voted out, he was singled out. And not, not just that, when you look at a candidate and you say, you know what, okay fine, he belongs to a right-wing party, but he's educated, he's progressive, he's liberal, he is perhaps trying to reform the party from within, and so I'll vote for him still. Perhaps not for the party, but for the candidate. But do you even know in parliament which way that candidate is voting for? Is he voting the right way or the left way? You don't know that, and that voting record is a public record which you don't have access to. But we want to have, we want, we want the people to have access to that. And not just that, we want to actually formulate people's opinion actively. As and when bills will be presented in Parliament, a short summary of that would be put up so that people online could say yes or no. So we could actually start having a census and start involving more people and active politics, like is the case in Argentina right now. Has anybody heard of the app called Democracies? An app called Democracies is introduced in Argentina, which has been picked up by a mainstream party. And what the app does in short summary is that it actually is, it makes a register as a constituent and when a bill comes into parliament, a summary of it is based on the app and you actually vote on it. And when you are voting as a constituent, your respective MP and MNA gets your feedback and the MP and MNA knows, okay, okay, my people from my area want me to vote this way for this bill or that way for this bill. So people and democracy and parliament become real time and connect, are connected real time. And again, take it forward. We have something called to involve citizens more deeply, something called Awad Thaw, which is supposed to be a mobile app working on citizen journalism. If you have seen any flag, any banner, any poster, any office of any banned outfit in Pakistan, you could take a picture and upload it to our portal. And if you have heard any sermon of which involves hate speech in any rally, in any mosque, in any madrasa, you can record the audio and upload it to our portal and you can become an active reporter for us because like I said, we are online media, we can emulate, we cannot, we cannot emulate GEO or ARY in Pakistan, those big structures in Pakistan, but we can get citizens to come and do that for us. And in the end, it's all supposed to tie up to the dream project I initially had. And this presentation I've shown you in reverse because the first idea which came to my mind when I thought what to do regarding human rights violations in Pakistan was this campaign. An online campaign which I've been calling Hamkadam and it's supposed to be a helpline. It's supposed to be a helpline for that couple called Shama and Shazal, who were being bullied because they had differences with the feudal of the town, but nobody listened to them, and they were later burned out on, on charges of blasphemy because they had nobody to call, nobody to go to because they did not even trust their own local police officer. They did not know that there's, there's anybody out there who could provide them legal aid, if there's anybody out there who could provide them counseling, is there anybody out there who could get them out in this situation. And if you can even save one couple a year, I would find myself to be, have to be redeemed. And this helpline, of course, will be made popular through the website and through the radio and through the portal. So people have direct access and through this website, through this helpline, we're actually going to know real history and real facts and real testimonials and real stories about real people facing real-time discrimination in Pakistan. The website for that is Never Forget Pakistan. You can log on to it. It's just one form on it. And you go to this form, you sign in with Twitter and Facebook, you come on board as a team member, 
I am here to recruit you as the team members for this because for this we need journalists, bloggers, graphic designers, visual artists, documentary makers, filmmakers, research writers, academics who can come and populate the content and at the same time tell us how they see problems in Pakistan and what should be the solution. So we form a team and that's it. In America, why I'm here going university after university speaking to print Pakistani minds of Pakistani origin is for you to be part of the team and this is actually a human resource drive because getting funds is very easy in Pakistan by the way. The US government, the British government and the Norway government very specifically have asked to meet me. I don't know whether to just learn about me or to offer me funds or help me, I don't know that. But usually when you go that way, it's very easy to find funds. Especially if you're single out in, pa in Pakistan like I am because of threats and whatnot. But I want the people to contribute. If I can get a filmmaker to donate time, I don't pay to hire a filmmaker. If I can get a blogger and a researcher to come on board, I need to pay for that. Yes, there would be funding involved and that funding would primarily come through Pakistanis, not through a foreign government. But more than that, if you want to live and build a life for yourself in America, but still want to do something for Pakistan, I'm trying to come up with a solution for that. And you can help me improve and make it better. And thank you for your time. And that's the end of the presentation. faith in the World Bank because people are not so concerned about democracy and because we are conceding that space and because they know that the, these people are not conceding space, these people are propagating the agenda and these people are going out and getting supporters, perhaps this is an easy way for us to get vote because people are not so heavily devolved. I if I could sit here, I could find Pakistanis here who still think that military will provide solution to problem. They still think that democracy can't work in Pakistan and that's the notion we want to challenge. When we had military, we went to Afghanistan, another person's war, another country's war, and had to spill over a country. We had democracy, we refused to go into Germany, even though we depended on the Jesus country. That's how democracy works for us. And the idea is to get people integrated in the democratic system and not be as disabilitized as they are right now. So, again, once you consider and can see the space that just you are a stakeholder, you have a seat on the table, they will dictate terms. The idea is to isolate them. At the same time, through movements like Reclaim Your Mosque, engage their followers. I will not be able to convert Abdul Aziz or Rodhiyanji or Aranjit Faruqi. The idea is to convert that person who is swayed by them, who is not militant here, who is militant here but not in terms of picking up arms. My name is Nani Alam. I'm the president of Pakistan American Congress. I am delighted to see you that uh, you're working overseas in the United States, where liberty is free and we have a free society. What is your plan to do in Pakistan with the young people, while the older generation, in the name of Allah, kill everybody? No matter what happens. I'm a Christian. And I left the country 45 years. And recently, accident happened on Lahore, Bahar Kuluni. The children and then the, all the young generation, they put in the jail. Innocent people. How can you? So I am actually coming to universities in America after having gone to over 15 universities in Pakistan. I actively go to universities, I actively give talks in universities to a certain extent that it has become a problem for Jamaat Islami. In Karachi University, in Punjab University, Jamiat has given specific instructions that I'm not allowed, I'm not welcome. And students have told me that when they wanted to get talks mine arranged. And I actively get involved in them. But when I know that the school's faculty or administration is going to get 
blackmailed by Jamaat Islami and I won't be allowed. That's why the online portal there is, because the young people are on Facebook and on Twitter. And again, when we see that change is coming, by seeing how many people have come out on the streets and are rallying for a cause, that's not how change is going to come. Because those people out on the protest, when they are at the protest, they're cut out from the world. Change is going to come by, again, creating awareness. Because if you're sitting in your school, in your office, at home, wherever you're working in a hospital, a lawyer's office, a bank, wherever you are, if you're getting awareness through this, then you can talk to your colleagues, you can talk to your mates, you can talk to your family and spread the message forward. And that's why real change is going to come through awareness, not by gathering to and asking people to rally up because as far as rallying is concerned for a cause, until unless you don't have money, you would not be able to get people out. And the fact of the matter is that majority of the persecuted communities in Pakistan, the minorities, don't come from a lot of big income backgrounds. And for them, even to travel to a particular spot requires to pay for transport. And we experience that. For a certain protest, we actually have to drive in people from areas and actually pay for their bus transport. Why is it always so easy for right-wingers to get at a crowd? Because they send a bus, like a school bus, to a madrasa. All the students studying in the madrasa hostel are taken out, filled in the bus, and they're brought to the protest site. And you think, oh my god, they're such a big sport. No. All those kids are getting stipend there. All those kids are students there. And for them, it's like a school field trip, that rally. But what I'm asking to do, I cannot expect a man to wake up at 7 in the morning drop his schools, to sketch to school at 8 in the morning, go to work at 9 in the morning, work till 5, 5.30 in the morning, drive to Russia and come home at 7, 7.30 in the evening and then ask him to take out further two hours and come sit with me on the street and protest. That's not going to last long. That's not practical. Why the right wings are comes out? Because those are students. They've got nothing else to do during that time. They give an exemption from their own teachers and madrasas that right now this is all off time. You can come out and do whatever you want. This is what we want to do. So being realistic that way, this is the approach to actually work with young minds and create awareness so that they could carry on with their own lives because Pakistan is a struggling economy. Most of the people have to work, if not two, at least a little more than one job over time to pay their bills and to make things work. So that's why this is again, and my talks are there for all those universities who keep on inviting me and allow me to come. I'm <laughs> just looking at you just like that. Uh, why? <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> So, I understand your purpose and your recruitment and everything. Uh, my question is, do you get the people you need to do this with the website? What's to stop from whoever it is in Pakistan deciding, oh, this is, you know, what it, with the blasphemy law, things like that. We could do things online. But at some point, if we don't, if there's no change in certain laws, one is being blasphemy, depending on what kind of coverage or stories or, or you know, awareness that's being put out, how would you, how do you see this, this, that happening? Well, see, laws have to change eventually, and the laws are actually a catalyst of change as well. For example, when King said that I have a dream, nobody was stopping him to dream because there was no, no law in place at that time which would stop a man of color to become the president. And Obama is living that dream right now. But in Pakistan, you can even fathom the thought of a non-Muslim ever leading the country. So laws do need to change. But how would the law change? Law would change, and if seats are empty, by the way, you guys can come and just sit right now. If you are going to want, it's all right. Um, if people are radicalized, and the parliament and the electives are coming from the people, they are presenting a radicalized majority or radicalized population, and the laws would be becoming more and more radical. So you first need to re-radicalize the people before you can expect the parliament to have the guts to actually pass laws which undo this effect. You cannot ask them to pass laws and make amendments to undo the effect if the people are not even willing to accept it. But the masses of Pakistan are like, yes, blasphemy law is right, and killing in the name of God is right. As I just saw you in that picture, as that mob came out. But what's to stop them coming back and saying, you know, you're, uh, you're wrong, it, it is... Uh, uh, acceptable to kill in the name of Islam. Awareness? Do you know what I mean? Like, no, awareness. Being the opposite of awareness. what you're trying to put out Awareness. Here. My awareness is not based on, when I'm talking about Islam, my awareness is not based on the international human rights. My awareness is based on actually what religion has said. When I talk about working in that think tank, and in that think tank, I'm working with muftis who have gone through the madrasa system, who were radicalized. Some of them were even sent to Afghanistan for training, have even met Mullah Omar, and have seen the dark pits and dark names. And through their own education, further education, have become more secular and progressive and don't want people to go that way. And they have experienced what a benefit for them. That now they want to become teachers. So when you engage people in a dialogue and de-radicalize them, that means you have masses 
who would demand that this law should be changed now. But if you only expect the parliament to do so when the masses are rallying against it, it would never happen because a government wants to remain popular, not right. In Pakistan, a government is happy being popular. It does not matter if they're right or wrong because the consensus in the next is the consensus to go by is what the masses think. Mr. Brown. Yes. So she raised a point like so. Are you Manal's sister by any chance? Yeah. So from the fair, I can see the recognition, yes. <laughs> Remnants. So, yeah, we are so um, she raised the point saying, so what's your stance? Is it pro-negotiation or anti-negotiation? No, 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 what no, no, no. What do you want I to don't say? want to negotiate with the terrorists at all. I don't want to negotiate with Abdul Aziz or Anandir Farooqi, but I want to educate their followers. It's a difference in that. You so, said you had some... Uh, and the reason for that is, and, uh, those muftis, by the way, uh, by the way, every mufti is not a radical, please. Every mufti is not a radical. But they, I mean, my parents got married, right? So my mom came and officiated the marriage, he was not a radical, clearly. Uh, I mean, when I'm going to, if I'm going to fall sick, or if I go actually pray in Friday congregation, I'm not praying behind a radical necessarily. You could very well be one. The people I'm dealing with are clergymen, are religious scholars, and scholars means they're educated. Radical is a political mindset. What they have is religious education. Let me so, finish my question. Yes. So, this is a good effort, and it would reach those who can access it and are literate enough. But those who are taken and sh basically bus to madrasas are those families who are basically trading their kids for that time and they're trading it for money or for whatever reason. No. A lot of the families in urban centers and in rural areas, which there is, I don't see enough. Families don't get paid, by the way, to they send the kids to madrasas. They get they get services. Kids get, no, no, no. It's, it's a trade-off. No, no, no. If it you is a, these are facts. Child, if you in the modern madrasa systems, and you might have read the research on Pakistan by you and other trusts, I actually question the pure research a lot because of my own experiences because I've gone into these madrasas and I've met the kids and I've met the students. That kid will get a stipend, he will get uniform, he will get a hostel to live in and he will get two meals a day but a madrasa would not say that we are also going to pay the utility bills of your house. It, it still incentivizes the system of getting a kid into a madrasa and those young minds that are still being radicalized at the madrasa how do you, what is your plan on reaching? If you right now on Facebook, go to the page of Lal Masjid mm -hmm. or Sipai Sahaba, right. all 15 of Sipai Sahaba's pages, be it any chapter, they all have thousands of followers. Who are those followers? If you think that kids in madrasas don't have a smartphone and don't have access to Facebook or Twitter. That is maybe in some cases, but a lot of kids, there's millions of kids in Pakistan. Would you, you, would, would you accept the fact that a madrasa would not allow me to come and talk to their kids? I don't know. That's my question. You actually think that Aurangzeb Farooqi would or Dhan would allow me to come and give this presentation in the madrasa? Oh, Tell us what your stance is. Tell no, us but that, that, that's what I'm saying. They would not because I'm hurting their economics. I'm calling them out as a madman, as a bad people. Right. They would not allow me. The idea is rather, if for lack of a better word, to infiltrate their ranks. And technology allows you to do that because people, for example, a lot of people in protest who come and are standing in the protest with me, they actually wave Weefu and Dada masks in Karachi because they don't want the picture taken with me because even their parents don't want them to align and associate with me because of my views, because they come from the radical background. But technology, what you're looking on your phone, your own web browsing history is private and they don't have to physically meet me to get my message. And what technology can do, by the way, again, yes, you're right that not every single madrasa kid <coughs> will have access to technology, but even if 10 do, and 10 have been turned and have awareness, those 10 would share that thought with another. And the trickle down process is also some presumptive measures going to take into being. And also, as this thing is going to be created, it's also going to go into the stages of trial and error, where campaigns are going to be tried and tested and again and again. But the only reason reliance is on online technology is because print media would censor me, national media would censor me. I've served as an anchor for six months on apparently a progressive liberal channel. And I was not allowed to be live for one minute and one second of those six months because my editor told me, you're going to have a TMI moment with the people in Pakistan. So given that, these are the realities I have to work with. And if I'm limited, it's not because of convenience, Can it's because be of lack of options. Can you that new law that uh, stops freedom of speech if it does pass? The website is not hosted in Pakistan, by the way, so they can't shut us down. They can criminalize me, they can arrest me, but they can't shut the website can down. Can they block it? Like YouTube's been blocked? But you can completely reroute it. YouTube does not reroute itself to Pakistan because it doesn't <laughs> care, but you can very easily reroute the websites, even if they block the URL, you can keep on rerouting it. Okay. So that, yeah. that, 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 that
23,000 votes in the city. And how big is the population of Karachi? No, no, not in the city. In his constituency. constituency of Kaidabad, where only above 18 <coughs> people are identified as voters. And he only lost by 200 votes. And his name mm. is very, um, sounds like somebody from an immigrant family. By the way, I contested elections. Right. And the one thing I'm proud of is that in my constituency, even though I lost, but I got more votes than his party. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm proud of. Also, by the way, what online technology could do, and very interesting for you to know, Sipai Sahaba is a party functioning all over Pakistan. As a big infrastructure, so is Sunni Tehreek, the Barelvi Jamaat. And people say Barelvis are moderates, but when it comes to blasphemy, they're even more militant than the Bandis. Both of these parties, having their whole national structure, were contesting for my constituency. And I only had a budget of 50,000 rupees, my one month salary saving, because I was asked to leave my work when I said I want to contest elections. My corporate law firm said, leave the place. You are not allowed to do that. And I took those savings, just $500, and I ran a campaign solely on Facebook by placing ads, yeah. and I got more votes with $500 mm -hmm. than Muttahadini Mahas and then Sunni Tehri. So saying that honor technology would not work mm -hmm. is, there is senses, I mean my own experience, that I was able to penetrate people more through my message because it was more trendy and went more viral. I still get a feeling it's more in the urban centers and not getting to where it needs to go. No, the and rural, the the rural areas network. are not supposed to be the people. Like I said, third right now is a secular place. It's the urban centers when they radicalize people in madrasas. Again, the madrasas are primarily found in the urban centers. It's there with the literate uses. If I give you a piece of hate literature and you do not even know how to read, how would you learn anything from it? Setting up uh, or radicalizing rural areas is actually having a more cost on them because they have to build a madrasa or a mosque, a physical space, hire an imam who would sit and through vocal sermons over a long period of time, making sure that attendance is mandatory would radicalize you. But if I give you a pamphlet with hate literature, you can take it home and read it at your own pace, at your own time. And in urban centers, that's how Chhang, for example, where Sipa Sahaba was founded, is a backward small town urban center, not a village. And I'm going to talk towards the very end about what the reality of Pakistan was and what I'm trying to really reclaim and what Pakistan really was by reading an excerpt from his biography in Chhang. And do highlight to me when there's only like minute left and I have to wind it up because I don't want people like walking out and missing on the end part. So this is just on the nothing but going back to the helpline idea a little bit. Uh, out of curiosity, you spoke about the couple who could be saved. So who would be on the other side of the helpline? Our team. And the idea is to link it up. The idea is to initially link it up with a medical school which has a psychology department. So students who have done or reading psychology, second year, third year students who are, could work as interns to provide that basic counseling in the native tongue, tongue. And if somebody says that I'm being actually threatened, it's one thing that you know I'm being bullied in school because of the religion, sectarian grounds, or at work. But when someone says I'm being threatened, and if they're willing to give their identity, then they would have access to a lawyer in the nearby area. And again, this is called building that infrastructure from ground above and from ground below. Do we have a team of 1,000 lawyers? No. Do we want to develop one? Yes. This right now is a thing I'm going to be curating and I want to curate it with you. And again, I and what the work I do, what I've done so far, has not been big money. I've only protested outside Lal Masjid with 400 protesters. And that was the news. And they got rattled at a Taliban commander had to call me. I only protested against al Sunnat al Jamaat with 400 people. And they got so rattled that Aurangzeb Farooqi got his guards to shoot at his car, orchestrated an attack, and filed an FIR against me that I'm a Sunni Shia militant who tried to kill him. So they, that's how scared they got. And then that didn't work. They also tried to get a blasphemy case suggested me. It's starting from ground above, but when people come in, the funds will come in, the structure will come in. And I'm talking about the next five, six years of Pak by the way, building this. Not in a few months. It's going to go through phases. So You've had troubles and multitasking. Yeah, well, um, so I have two questions. The first question is in regards to I I don't like to I, sorry sorry. I'm just gonna say the second question. Yes. So I I taught in Pakistan for two years and I was in the Jewish community in the West Bank. And and there's a lot of young people that are very interested in doing work in Pakistan for sure. But then the question always comes that when it comes time for graduation, it's very important to go get good jobs, which means find like stuff to come out in London and work for kind of 
Well, the idea is that of course your basic team, you have paid employees, it's not going to be all voluntary work. It's not going to be all voluntary work. It's going to be a basic structure which would hire a team of basic people which make the basic system work. But the reason I want so many volunteers coming in is to do things at a fast paced level and fast track things. And actually have those people who can make the time and who have the ability to come and collaborate and work with us. And so who's perhaps we could curate further projects for which we could actually get specific more funding and set those targets. Because I cannot stop anybody from getting married, having their own family, or supporting their own parents, and for that going out of Pakistan to build their job. I cannot force it upon anybody. But what I can do is do that, that if they still want to contribute in any little way to Pakistan, there should be some forum through which they're able to do that. Now coming back to your first question, and if you just repeat the last part of it again. Well, I'm just the army part and the state part for yeah, you. How, how is I, I, I don't engage with the army, I don't need to, I don't have to, and I shouldn't. Because who are they? Why should I give them or concede them the space that, oh, Jerome Saab, you are the power player. No, you are not. Get out of here. Go on the border. Seriously, this is democracy. One may record this and say that I'm bad here, but this is why I'm frustrated with the people of Pakistan. The idea when the Musharraf came into power, the diaspora here was winding and dining him. Oh, our savior has come. Oh, Lord. Seriously? Is a general going to, uh, going to lead you to emancipation? No. Democrats will and democracy will. A general three will do a one war. A democratic parliament has saved us from Yemen. I don't deal and talk to generals and colonels. Did they get in touch with me? Yes. And I said, not interested. And they didn't get in touch with me because they needed me. They could replicate me 10 times over the sources they have. They got in touch with me, wanting to know whether they can control me. Whether I could be the little boy sitting in their lab, doing these things their way. And I said, no. As far as the Democrats are concerned, I have connections and I do talk to and I have immediate contacts with MNAs and MPs and every party because whatever I'm going to do here, I'm also going to try and engage with them and the idea is to reform the parties from within. Through this exercise, when we talk about making the population more aware, we're talking about making the electorates more aware and the electables more aware and trying to reform the party from within. The idea is not to say that the fifth party is going to become a savior. Why can't we simply work on reforming the existing structure? After one time, Imran Khan, Nawaz Sharif, Sultan Hussain Zardari will live themselves out, will eventually have to move space. That's the law of nature. Some other person would come up. And how do you want to treat them that? Do we want to isolate them by saying, oh, he's a butto, nothing better could be expected from him? Or he is from the Khan party, nothing better could be expected from him? Or he, he followed Sultan Hussain, nothing better could be expected from him? You do not know. But Mustafa Kumal, People love him, people don't like Altao Hussain. Well, Muswa Kamal was Altao Hussain's choice for me, by the way. Not yours or not mine. So saying that nothing good can come out of any party is also a wrong approach to take. So I have connections there and I want to build on that. And I'm sorry that I got a bit angry regarding the general's question. But time and again in every university, people say that, you know, the military and the military and the military. And that's the thing. And we focus so much on the military. And I don't blame you for that because you are representing the majority of Pakistan in terms of you having taught them and seeing what people think. When you are going to give that space to the military, you actually by default are making your own state institutions and your own prime minister irrelevant. And we should not do that anymore. Can I just one sure. question? I want to ask you about this. Yes. And the reason I brought the military is because of the reason that I thought... The that horrible work they're doing there. ...secular progressive university, but... When, no, it's when, not. When, when, no, but when the office starts going in a certain direction, all of a sudden you always find it. That's why well, right now in Lums, they did not have let the event happen, and, but, but then again, but then again, the students came out and protested, the faculty came out and protested, but the military put pressure and not have the dialogue happen. And that's again something the military would have done. But as we'd have noticed here, the focus here is on religious extremism and militancy. But if somebody would also like, ask me to comment on the issue of Baloch issue, I can comment on it. But is it part of this particular project right now? <laughs> because I cannot spread myself so thin. And I, I'm not running for the office of the Prime Minister here that I can make sure. But as far as the Balochistan is concerned, and the reason the banned outfits I'm talking about here are the banned outfits spreading violence or doing acts which are considered crime in the name of religion. As far as the Balochistan movement is concerned, I believe those guys have genuine political grievances which should be addressed because the people who are not given resources, people who are disenfranchised, but never made part again of a social political fiber, and those are not expansionist. They don't want to come and march from Quetta to Islamabad and throw away your government. 
They just want their own land and their own resources and live with it. They know like the Taliban or the Sipah Sahaba want to take over the country. So you cannot again compare apples to oranges. And what has happened in Balochistan and what the military has done and even democracy. It was Ulfikar Ali Bhutto who got Bukti to declare Mangles and Murray in 1970s as traitors and forced them to leave the country. So even democ democratic governments have not done any justice to Balochistan. So yes, no ifs and buts there. And I'll be very clear, if I'm going to talk about human rights, I'm not going to have any ifs and buts about Balochistan. What's happening there and what the state has done is wrong completely and utterly. Um, yeah. Now I have to take other questions. Yeah. Five minutes, two more questions. You will be on dinner with me, you know, so it's all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm You're not coming to dinner. I'm going to stand here outside and have the thing with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the question. Yeah. All right. So I like to get pointed into fighting first. Um, you spoke about the encounters, but well, I said that oh, last twenty years not punishable by death, and I guess with PKM are more so. Um, you're trying to provide a counter narrative that is, I guess, close to whatever the Taliban are, or other institutions are um, instilling in the people of Pakistan. But do you really think that that is a more feasible option than trying to eradicate the concept of organized religion in the Pakistan? But well, you're talking area? about how to get to Z and through A, B, C, they're like around what, 24, 26 alphabets? So your utopia is that religion and state don't get involved. But the way to that, you have to have catalysts to work towards that dream. <laughs> yeah. Reclaim your mosque is not the utopia. It's a catalyst to first de-radicalize people, make them moderate enough that they could even they could even engage in a dialogue about what is secularism and what it can do for you. So it's of course, I agree with that. At the end of the day, we don't want politics mixing with religion. There's no doubt about that. That's why contested elections with a very clear uh, manifesto a secular manifesto. And those who are leaving right now, just five more minutes, I'm going to read something out which would be interested in knowing. Okay, so just first a comment that I'm probably one of your biggest supporters and I watched each and every video that you've posted and I agree. Are you coming to the dinner? I want to come to the dinner. It's a great area. So one, my two questions, one, are you going to stand for the upcoming election? Uh, as far as safety is concerned, I don't carry any security or any weapons or anything because in Pakistan when I go to universities and I say, speak up, be vocal, do things the right way, they say, sir, security, what about that? And the day I carry cards, people won't identify with me. And it's a price to pay for everything and Pakistan is again a reality. And the reason I am doing it to make sure that other people also step out and if we become the majority, then the minority will get scared of us. And about contesting elections. Uh, not again to draw parallels, I'm not even an iota of how great that man was and what his struggle represented. But why does in Pakistan every man wants to be Obama? We need a Martin Luther King first. We don't even have a sense of direction. What about creating political and social awareness? And if I contest for the office, yes, for my constituency, I'll be doing perhaps good work, or at least I hope to. But I would disenfranchise again and isolate myself from the audience I could have had in other public parties if I was not a competitor. <laughs> So right now the idea is to reach out to voters of MPM and PTI by not making them insecure that I'm taking away the votes or I'm taking away your power. You stay where you are, you enjoy the perks you do, but just do things the right and the better way. The reason I contested elections was again to instill the thought in the mind of a common Pakistani that those who want to take politics full on and that's the solution to the problem will do so. I did it, I got to a certain extent and you could learn from my experience and perhaps do it 10 times better and even get to the parliament. So, I'll take your last yeah. and then I'll wrap it up. Yeah, actually, <laughs> you did answer my question when this gentleman asked, but let me take a minute just to thank you. Uh, you spoke your heart and also many of our hearts who spoke. My question actually was going to be, who will <coughs> reinterpret Islam or putting the other way around, who will pull Islam out of? this whole. I'm not a prophet, so I can't do that. <laughs> I don't want to do that. When I say reclaim your mosque, I'm not talking about reinterpreting Islam. I'm just saying what, how it has been <coughs> interpreted actually with the majority and how it exists. Just take me, just making people more aware on that. So when they're actually listening to a sermon in a mosque, the congregation is, they will actually question him because what we learned through this portal, through the references is something else. And the guy, the Imam is saying in the mosque, 
is perhaps something else. My idea is not to interpret it. I'm I'm not a God sent apostle. I'm not. Too My young. point is only to read it, what it how it is said, and to report it, and at least by it true to our history and not manipulate it or make it perverse because people do so to gain from it. So just to set that record right. And I believe not one man can rescue Islam if you want to. Muslims as a whole could have to do that. Mm. When we say not in my name, we actually have to act like that in all of us eventually. Mm. And for that, we would need awareness again. That what our religion actually said. So that we could actually believe not in my name. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to end uh, my thing when people say that, you know, what is Pakistan? And people here, when perhaps a non-Pakistani meets you and he says, well, you know, in your country, is it all about terrorists and whatnot? And you say, no. Hey, come on, YouTube. Have you seen Coke's video? <laughs> <laughs> this is Pakistan. Oh my God, people singing in Nasik. Well, yes, you know, Coke's video does a lot to preserve that culture and to highlight it. But, you know, Coke's video is not Pakistan. It's big corporate media selling music. It's Coke selling its stuff. Similarly with Pepsi and Wawa's and SKP and doing all of those things. Not to take away from the good things they do. I mean, Coke's video again has done a lot to promote our culture. But is our culture only about song and dance? My concern is, if in that Coke studio, out of all the singers and band members, if anyone actually belongs to the minority sect or the minority faith, how is his life in Pakistan? And how is it affected? And how he gets affected outside Coke studio, out in the streets? I want to know that. And that would be Pakistan. But what Pakistan was, because when I talk about reclaiming Pakistan, I talk about going back in history. And I'm not going to go back to Karachi and talk, talk about French speech or Sintla. I'm not going to talk about going to Lahore and talk about uh, MM Alam Road or go to Islamabad and say, oh, go to Kasar market and you see the real Pakistan. Well, no. Uh, I'm going to go back to Jhang, where Sipa Sahaba started, where Sipa Muhammad actually also started. And Jhang is again that prime simple example which tells you what Pakistan was and the Pakistan we lost and we need to reclaim. And for that, I'm going to read an excerpt. And this is the last words of my interview today. This excerpt is from a biography not written by anyone but Ilyas Wala Koti, the editor of the newspaper which Sipa Sahaba published. He's a Sipa Sahaba guy. And the biography is of the founder of Sipa Sahaba, Haq Nawaz Nandi. And the biography was called Amire Azmat, the Caliph of Greatness, as they put it. So it is their account of how Jhang was in 1985. <coughs> Jhang was a backward district dominated by feudal lords. They founded license in Shiaism for the life of pleasure they desired. And so the rural gentry had become Shia. Under the influence, the peasants and other members of the lower caste also went over to Shiaism, but even those who didn't have remained neither Shia nor Sunni and had no sense of shame at being devoid of religious identity sunk in ignorance. They retained some of their traditional customs in the name of Sunniism, while in other respects they had become assimilated with the Shia. They knew nothing of their beliefs nor of their religious orientation. They did not practice their faith, nor were they bothered about it and practicing it. All they had was certain rights of ignorance and nothing else. Well, this of course part is where they are blaming how Shias are bad and how even Sunnis are becoming Shia or are right now, you know, becoming akin to it. So they don't like the Shia. But here comes the most interesting part of what Haknawal Changbi went through when he was founding Sipa Sahaba. In all matters of happiness and grief in life, they were as one. If anyone tried to reform the situation and to indicate to them the differences between the Shia and the Sunnis, he was accused of fomenting discord, of being a sectarian. He would be deemed undesirable and would never again be allowed in the area. Maulana Aknawaz, after he became convinced of what the truth was, began preaching and he was defined in the face of all opposition. And that opposition was the pluralistic, secular, progressive values which Jhang had. And what Jhang has been reduced to now, that the town Haknawal Changvi lived in, is named after him. The mosque he preached in, has been named after him now. He is now, Jhang is the headquarters of Sahaba. But that was the reality of Jhang. Not big corporate media, not big urban centers. Small urban centers, backward areas, common people of Pakistan, low middle class people of Pakistan, the grassroots of Pakistan, the real masses of Pakistan. And that is what we're trying to Thank you once again for your time.
thanks a lot Vijayan, for being here. Thank you like everyone for being here. And uh, I just like to end by saying that uh, we just the board is the idea good. is great. The, uh, the middle I mean, class, the middle class, brothers and sisters. We talked about the brand also gone and talked in Brooklyn. Uh, where are you going? Uh, what you are? No, 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 no. no. Idea is to spend time. No, no, no. Yes.